Bridget from Suburban Sand Castles and I'm here with Dr Nick Rose, he's National Coordinator of the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance. And Nick, you're spearheading really as part of your organisation the production of a film called Fair Food. Can you tell us a little bit about that film? Okay, so that film is really about bringing to an Australian audience for the first time stories of Australians who are what we call Fair Food Pioneers. And that means blazing a trail towards a food system that's based on enhancing our health and well-being as people and stewardship and care of the land for ourselves and future generations. And it's important because this is the first time these stories from Australians have been told for Australians. We've had lots of documentaries about food politics and issues in the food system, but almost all of them have come from the United States and some from England. So we saw a few years ago that there was a real gap this particular genre, and that's why we crowdfunded $33,000 to make this documentary, which we're very pleased now to bring to Australian people. It's really encouraging too that that was as a result of a lot of crowdfunding. It really suggested there's a strong appetite for this kind of film and this kind of movement. Um, you talk about uh, Australia's food system as being broken. Can you explain why you see that, um, that as the case? Okay, well, if we look at a system sort of go back a step and ask what the purpose of that system is. So when we're thinking about food and agriculture, I would say that the purpose of the system is about feeding ourselves, about sustaining and nurturing our bodies and optimising our health and well-being, and about caring for our land and our water systems and leaving them intact and healthy for future generations. So I would say that should be the basic purpose of the food system. Unfortunately, what we have now inherited as a food system, particularly in the last 50, 60 years, is a food system that is producing the opposite results. We're seeing real deterioration in our bodies, in our levels of health and well-being. We're seeing de degradation and erosion of our soils and contamination of our waterways, mass loss of biodiversity. So there's all these indicators, not just in Australia, this is global as well, that suggest that measured by those criteria, that basic purpose of the food system, it is really not delivering what it should be delivering. So that's the suggestion that it's that it's broken. However, there's another perspective which I say, which is that maybe the purpose of the system isn't actually to enhance our health and well-being and care for the environment if we look at who the system is benefiting. So the system is really controlled by a small handful of large multinational, national and multinational corporations, and it's really being driven by them for the purposes of their short-term financial gain. And measured by that criteria, the system isn't broken, it's actually doing extremely well. It's very yeah, successful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's successful if you're looking at that as your model. You know, if your model is economic uh, activity and, and growth, then that's great. But if we're looking at our health and the health of the environment, then it's, it's broken indeed. Um, I think that that's a really interesting way to look at it, is that our food, our food system has been industrialised, and, and as a result of that, we're really in a food system that's not necessarily looking after our diet, but rather it's the most cost-effective way to produce food. The most cost-effective way to produce food is often lots of corn, lots of wheat, lots of manufactured foods, lots of sugar, um, and that's obviously a really popular in the media at the moment. Is this whole I food sugar movement, all these paleo movements. But I do wonder sometimes if they miss the point, which is that there's something inherently wrong with our food system to begin with, as to why we're facing. Yes, and in fact, just yesterday, just picking up on your point that there's grounds for interest in this at the moment, you know, there's just in the last couple of weeks, there's been some big events in Melbourne. Uh, Joel Salatin, the you know, heretic American farmer, was here uh, on the 19th of February speaking at the Collingwood Town Hall at a rally organised by the agrarians, the regenerative agriculture movement in Australia. Around 500 people turned out to hear him speak, uh, along with a number of you know, fair food pioneers in Australia. Uh, and then yesterday, the Grossi family, who are the owners of the Omber and Florentino restaurants here in Burke Street, organised the very first tomato festival, celebrating the Italian culture in Melbourne and the making of the passata at the, at the end of the summer. 2,000 people turned up at Farm Fagano in South Moran uh, to, you know, to celebrate Melbourne, the Melbourne Easy movement, they call the Melbourne Italian culture and traditions. Uh, I spoke along with a number of others at that on our speakers panel talking about every ingredient is sacred and looking at the you know, really the, the sacredness of our food and the meaning it has in our culture. And for me, uh, one of the most sacred ingredients uh, at a global level is corn. Uh, I spent many years in Central America, living in Guatemala, my children were born there. 
and uh, it really came home to me working alongside some of the Mayan uh, peoples there, just how important corn is uh, to their culture and their traditions. And in fact, they, according to their mythology, they believe people were created from corn, and their corn. Every family has a corn pot where they get their daily, literally their daily bread, comes from the corn outside their back door. Uh, they have tomatoes and beans growing amongst the cornfield, and that cornfield actually uh, is a microcosm of the universe according to their uh, cosmology. And so the four corners, the way it's plotted out, and then there is the universe. But what we've seen is the industrialization of corn and its, its huge monoculture now in the United States, where there's 95 million acres of corn, 93% of which is GMO corn, huge volumes of chemical pesticides, and most of that corn isn't used to feed people. It's used to make ethanol, and, it uses, it's, uh, and it's used to make uh, uh, to, to grain feed animals in factory farming systems. So, uh, and, and, and a lot of the rest of it is used to make high fructose corn syrup, which saturates so much of our, you know, our junk food and our fast food is a big contributor to the diabetes epidemic. So you know, we've gone from corn being a sacred you know, as part of spiritual ingredients for indigenous populations in Central America to, to really being a driver of massive loss of biodiversity and uh, you know, mass cruelty to animals um, and, and massive deforestation and loss of, uh, you know, loss of a, a diverse and resilient food system. Mm, yeah, it's, it's heavy stuff, I think, when you get into it. In terms of this film, as I mentioned, this has generated, are you seeing a lot of great feedback from different areas of the community around what this message is? And also, I suppose that it's not all doing good, that there are lots of producers and lots of entrepreneurs doing exciting things. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, our work as a food sovereignty movement in Australia, and that, I should say that's not just, you know, it's something we've dreamed up here in Australia. This is part of a global movement that was started by small farmers in the 1980s and now includes over 200 million people in 80 countries around the world. So this is one of the world's biggest social movements that we're trying to bring to Australia here. Um, you know, our, our work has always been about pointing out the problems and the destructive consequences of this very industrialised, globalised food system, but more importantly, telling the story and amplifying the work of the people that we're doing things on the ground right now to change it and to turn it around. And that's what this film is about. It's, Recognising and celebrating the work across the And the feedback we've got has been you know, so far fantastic. I was in Canberra on the 11th of February. We had 180 people at the National Library of Australia Theatre. Um, and it's, it's, the film is really a conversation starter. That's what I realised that the people came there uh, both to see the film but to talk with each other about concerns they had and, and ways forward and opportunities. So people stayed, you know, the film went for an hour, people stayed for an hour and a half afterwards to hear a brief discussion panel and then talk and talk and talk about these issues. The screening that we're doing, we've got um, myself coming to speak and we've got um, somebody from the Santa table coming along to speak. And it's really about building that sense of community and that sense of support to help people carry this this knowledge into their lives and, and connect with producers, I guess, who can help them on that journey to be a bit more conscious about the choices that they're making, not only for you know, the environment, for the, you know, the food movement going forward, but also for their health. I mean, got such a responsibility to our children to, to really consider the choices we're making today and how, what kind of future we're going to pass them in as well. You know, I look at the supermarket and you see these private label, you know, tins of food that just take up, you know, more and more space, you know, you one dollar milk that, you know, is slowly but surely squeezing over the farmers and you wonder how far can that go? Yeah, right. That's my question. Right, yeah, well that's, that's, I guess what we're saying here is a big challenge to us as a country and a society. What does food mean to us ultimately? Is it just, you know, the checkout price in the supermarket or is it something more important than that? Because with farmers, you know, it's, the stats suggest we're losing them at the rate of maybe 7 to 10 every day from the land because of the price pressures, the so-called cost price squeeze where the costs of running the farm business have gone up and up over time and yet the price they've been receiving has stayed flat or even gone down. So 70% or more of Australian farmers can't actually survive just from what they produce on the farm. They depend on off-farm income. And there's a saying that the only happy farmer is one whose spouse is a nurse or a teacher, which is really, I think, an indictment uh, that we can't support our farmers who do, you know, perhaps the most fundamentally important job of all in terms of feeding us, um, you know, that, that they are not supported by our current economy to do that in a viable way. Mm. Yeah, it's really thought-provoking. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today, Nick. I um, really enjoyed talking to you about that and looking forward to seeing you again.
Pleasure. Okay, thanks, Bridget. Thank you.